بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, I'm Dr. Ammar Bartain uh, Consultant Adult Hematology in Al-Hada Military Hospital Good evening everyone and welcome to our virtual webinar uh, tonight that is organized by the Saudi Society of Blood Disorder I would like to thank the Novartis company for sponsoring to this activity and it's my pleasure to be with you today as a moderator of this uh, activity with three outstanding speakers. And uh, as you know, our uh, talk today will be about the chronic myeloid leukemia. And uh, over the last decade, the chronic myeloid leukemia is evolving on uh, the management paradigm. And we are standing now in the era of uh, uh, treatment-free remission. So without any delay, I will start to introduce the first speaker uh, who, is, who is a well-known big figure in hematology and uh, uh, big figure in hematology and uh, uh, I'm so honored to introduce him. So Dr. Dennis Kim, he is uh, a physician clinical investigator in medical oncology and hematology at Prince Margaret uh, Hospital, Toronto, in Canada. He is an associate professor at Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. He is an associate faculty of member at the Institute of Medical Science at the University of Toronto. Dr. Dennis Kim is a member of uh, Canadian Hematology Society. He is uh, a member of uh, Canadian and of Blood and Bone Marrow Transplantation Group. He is an international member at American Society of Hematology. He is a member of Korean Society of Blood and Marrow Transplantation. He is a member in Korean Society of Hematology. And he is an associate member of American Association of Cancer Research. Dr. Kim, he has more than 200 publications and he has been an investigator for many reviews. He has contributed in many book chapters in hematology. I'm so honored to introduce you, Dr. Kim, and the stage for you. Thank you. So I will share my slide for my presentation. Uh, so can you see my slide? Yes. Good, thank you. So I'm going to talk about CMA Horizon, the present and the future. This is the title of my talk today. And this is my disclosure. And this is the topic for today. So I'm going to talk about my first part will be about the updated CMA guideline, including the ELN recommendation 2020. So as you can see, we, we are very familiar with the ELN recommendation, recommendation 2013. In recommendation 2013, they have a three category of response, optimal, warning, and failure. And you are very familiar with this molecular response scares. You see here uh, international scale and log scale. So from the time of diagnosis, if there's a reduction of transcriptal level by one log reduction, it is equivalent to, to 10%, which is our primary molecular milestone to be achieved in first three months, which is the same with 10%. And six months, we want our patient to achieve less than 1%. And in 12 months, in our patient to achieve less than 0.1%, then we call it, it is an optimal. In that case, we don't need to switch the current treatment. However, if a patient fails to achieve a certain uh, milestone, such as uh, fail to achieve less than 10% at six months, we call it failure, which means that we have to switch the medication. And in 12 months, if a patient fails to achieve less than 1%, then we call it failure. In that case, we have to switch the medication. However, in the context of TFR, which will require to achieve less than, uh, more than MR4 or for low reduction or 0.01%, in that case, what would be the optimal goal of their CML therapy? Maybe probably they have to achieve MR4 first before considering the TFR attempt, which require TKI discontinuation. So there's uh, some change in the ELN 2020 now, this is a ELN uh, recommendation 2020. You see here almost the same. However, there is some, uh, some difference here. First one is that uh, you see here, the three months milestone, if they fail to achieve less than 10%, they call it failure. Before that, they just call it warning. However, now they clearly call it 
If it is confirmed, it is a failure. Another thing is that you see here in the sub, uh, sub line here, for the patient aiming for the TFR, if the optimal response is not a MMR anymore or a three log reduction, it is the MR4 or 0.01%. We want our patient to achieve more than MR4 log reduction. Another change is that you see here, change of the treatment may be considered if MMR is not reached by three to four years, because based on the ELN 2013, there is a concern now in terms of the optimal response, then MMR, uh, the, the achievement of MMR in the first 12 months is uh, optimal criteria. In that case, if a patient failed to achieve, less, uh, failed to achieve a three low reduction in the first 12 months, should we switch the treatment right away or should we wait? If we wait, then how long do we have to, have to wait? The answer is provided here, a change of treatment may be considered if MMR is not reached by three to four years. Just uh, I want to compare the ELN 2013 and ELN 2020 in terms of the optimal response. As you can see here, this is ELN 2013. Optimal one log reduction in three months, two log reduction in six months, and 12 months three log reduction, and six and 12 months of failure. And this is ELN 2020. You see here the difference between the ELN uh, 2013 and 2020, uh, ELN 2020 is here. For three months milestone, the failure, uh, uh, so the failure means that if a patient failed to achieve less than 10% in three and six months, it is a failure. And another thing is that optimal uh, response. So they want our patient to achieve optimal uh, more than MR for any time if TFR is their goal of their CML treatment. That is the difference between ELN 13 and ELN 2020 in terms of optimal response criteria. Let's move on to the other uh, recommendation that has been published last year, GMMA criteria, which is from the Italian group. And you see here, they are now looking for, when TFR is the primary goal, what will be the optimal response criteria? Now you see here, you, you get the sense of how they are thinking of uh, incorporating the TFR concept in the, their case management of their CML. You see here, in 24 months, they want patient to achieve more than MR4, and they really want their patient to achieve MR4 or deeper response in first two years, if TFR is their goal of their CML therapy. So now you can see here, the TFR concept has been already applied into our clinical practice. Now, in case of me, when I see newly diagnosed CML patient, I start discussing about the, this TFR concept in first one or two visits of their clinic. And we, I use this concept when we make a decision for their TKI drug selection. This is the treatment option listed in ELN 2020, frontline therapy and second line therapy, as well as a treatment beyond the second line. Beyond the second line, allotransplant, ponatinib, or some experimental drug is available such as Asimini, but we don't have that many of choice right now. Let's move on to the second line setting. So in case of the second line, as you can see here, they mentioned in the ELN 2020 recommendation saying that the definition of response or milestone to second line treatment should be the same as the first line therapy. You might be curious why they are saying that. Let me explain in this way. It is a ELN 2013. And in, in ELN 2013, this is the definition of response for first line. And this is the definition for second line. They have a separate response criteria which gives a lot of confusion. And for example, one of the examples is here, you can see here for frontline setting, MMR is a goal of their CML treatment to be achieved in first 12 months in the setting of a first line. However, you see here, MR2 or two low reduction in first 12 months is the goal of a second line. Now you are, you are treating the same CML patient, but why they have a different definition of response? That is the reason that in the ELN 2013 uh, 2020, they just make it uniform. You see here, first line and second line, they use the same optimal criteria between the first and second line. 
mm uh, one log reduction in three months, two log reduction in six months, and the three log reduction in 12 months, they use the same optimal response criteria between first and second line in ELN 2020. Let's move on to the then the third line setting. Beyond the second line, they are saying that definition of acceptance, acceptable response to third line, fourth line, and fifth line cannot be formalized. However, BCIB transcript level, only one law, uh, two law reduction or 1% or CCYR are not enough for optimal survival. So you may need a, a little bit of a different parameter to evaluate a certain treatment that can be used for uh, third line or beyond. So this is my summary slide for my part one. So there is a new clinical recommendation guideline in CMA practice. And now we accept the MR4 as a definition for optimal response or their goal of a CML therapy when TFR is considered for their goal of a CML treatment. And they would like to remove a, a different parameter between the first line and second line. And they have a now uniform milestone for optimal response between the first line and the second line. Beyond the second line, still probably the use of a molecular response be, uh, below 1%, that is not enough for guaranteeing optimal long-term outcome in our CMA patient. So let's move on to a TFR. So now in ELN 2020 recommendation, they mentioned about the, some TFR uh, requirement. So now you see here, they only recommend the TFR attempt in CMA patient in first chronic phase and motivate the person. And you should have your uh, quantitative PCR test with the rapid turnaround time, et cetera, et cetera. And they measured about the minimum criteria versus the optimum criteria. Minimum criteria of TKI treatment duration more than five years or four years with the second generation or DMR duration more than two years. That is a kind of minimum criteria. And they also provide an optimal criteria. So it's a little bit confusing. Let me explain you in this way. Now, this is the recommendation from Tim Hughes and NCCN and ASMO, GMEMA, and ELN. You see here, just pay attention to this duration of TKI therapy. Some recommend eight years, some recommend five years, some recommend four years. It is all around the map. And you see here, in terms of the duration of DMR, two years, one year, or sometimes it's a little bit different. So my idea for my research project is that probably we, we need uh, some optimal cutoff for the duration of image treatment or MR4 response, which can provide a maximized probability of TFR success with a minimum duration of a certain treatment. So the main idea is that when you try to uh, continue to treat the patient with a longer period of time, you can maximize their TFR success. However, from certain time point, that chance can be maybe plateaued. Then maybe you might be able to treat the patient up to this period of time. And then you can try to uh, recommend your patient to stop the TKI therapy. Then you will have a really good success and you don't, your patient doesn't need to be on unnecessary treatment. If, if they can stop the treatment earlier, then they will be better, right? So that's the reason that we did a, a kind of research study. And we also look at that uh, one additional year of imaginary treatment or MR4 treatment duration seems to decrease their risk of TFR failure by roughly around 13%. Once you convert it to a TFR rate, then that rate will be roughly around 3% per year. So one additional year can increase your chance of TFR by 3%. And then we did a, a kind of statistical analysis. Now you see here, so now we adopted the recursive partitioning method. It is a little bit more complicated part. However, I'll just explain you one by one here. This is the probability of their TFR. For example, for example, six year, then you will see the, their TFR rate when they get treated more than six years, it's roughly around 60%. Versus if they get treated less than 60, then their TFR rate is around 
And then this is the proportion of the patient. So the number of the patient treated longer than the longer than the six years versus less than six years. And this is their positive predictive value and negative predict predictive value plot. So the meaning is that now you when they positive predictive value means that when they get treated longer than six years, what if their chance of uh, having a TFR success, then you can calculate that. That is uh, roughly 68%. And negative predictive value means that if they are less than six years of uh, TKI treatment, what if their failure rate of TFR? That is roughly 61%. So based on the six year time point, you will see that more than 70% or 60% of the patient, they, we can predict it properly. And this, this is the p-value. P-value, uh, this is minus log 10 p-value. Uh, this line is roughly uh, p-value of 0 0.01. And the higher than the deeper p-value, which means that this group of the patient is going to become uh, very, this value is going to become very significant. So based on this, we, we made a decision that the optimal cutoff value for eventual treatment duration was six years versus MR for duration of 4.5 years. I know it's a little bit complicated, but based on this, this is our conclusion. So taking into consideration, maybe six years of total treatment duration of imaginative therapy and 4.5 years of MR for response duration seems to be the optimal cutoff to maximize the probability of TFR success based on the Canadian TK discontinuation trial. So my next topic is about the uh, assembly trial, but I think that you know you are very familiar with this uh, data, so I will try to make it short, make it shorter as much as I can. So as you see here, uh, beyond the second line, as you see here, BCI transcript level just to uh, one percent is not enough to uh, to guarantee their optimal survival. But that is the reason that in this assembly study, which is a third line trial, they use a different color, a different uh, primer endpoint. Rather than the CCYR, they use MMR as their primary endpoint to evaluate that. So this is the structure of BCR AVF fusion protein. And now you see here, this is ATP binding site. And in this site, maybe bosutinib, nilotinib, imatinib, the satin and ponatinib can bind. However, aseminib, they, they bind in a different site called the uh, My Story Pocket here. So it has a different target for inhibition of ABLE1 protein, and it has very uh, less off-target effect, which means that it may not have uh, that much of uh, off-target side effects, such as uh, pleural effusion with the satinib or cardiovascular effect to with the uh, nilotinib or the uh, diarrhea with the bosutinib. It doesn't have that kind of uh, adverse event. So as you see here, primary endpoint was MMR at six months. And this is the primary endpoint. 25% of MMR with the aseminib versus 13% uh, of uh, MMR at uh, six months with the bosutinib. So definitely of uh, aseminib showed a better efficacy, roughly around two-fold higher uh, efficacy in comparison, higher in, uh, efficacy in comparison to bosutinib, it showed that. And they also look at the conventional uh, response parameter, which is CCYR in the setting of third-line therapy. And again, 40% versus 24%. And as you are aware of, the third line uh, bosutinib trial showed roughly around 25% of a CCYR rate. So I think that this number is quite equivalent to, to a third line phase two bosutinib data. And now you see here, aseminib showed a higher, higher number of a CCYR rate at six months. I want you to pay attention to this. So this is the overview of uh, adverse event. So you pay attention to adverse, the number of the cases uh, developing adverse event leading to discontinuation of the drug. In aseminib group, only 5.8%, they stopped the uh, aseminib due to adverse event. However, in case of bosutinib, 21% stopped their medication due to adverse event, which means that in terms of the off-target 
side effect or adverse event are seemingly seems to be much better in comparison to bosutinib. And that might be the reason that you can continue your uh, treatment as a third line option without having any kind of issue. And then you can improve your efficacy rate. Think about it. This patient is the patient who is being treated with this treatment as a third line therapy. They already failed the two lines of TKI therapy and they might be contraindicated for the other two TKI therapy for other comorbidity issues. They may have a diabetes, they may have a cardiovascular event, they may have a lung disease. And because of that, they are not indicated for other option of a TKI therapy. In that case, probably their third line therapy drug will be the, their last chance to eradicate their CMR. And in, in terms of that, the, the side effect profile is extremely important in terms of remaining the, their current treatment in the setting of third line therapy. And this is all AEs. You see here, as expected, a little bit of a higher instance of diarrhea with the bosutinib and GI, as well as liver enzyme elevation. However, in terms of the neutropenia, uh, assuming it doesn't show any higher number of uh, neutropenia, a little bit of higher number of thrombocytopenia, but that doesn't, that, that was not translated into a higher number of discontinuation of Asimini. So this is a summary of assembly trial. Asimini demonstrated the statistically significant and clinically meaningful superior efficacy in the setting of third line therapy. So my expectation is that in next five to 10 years, you will start to use this compound in your CMF practice in a different scenario, like not only the third line setting, maybe a front line, or even in combination, you might be able to think about to incorporate this compound in combination with other TKI to treat your CMF patient. So that is coming in our near future in our clinical practice. So my last part of my talk is about the somatic mutation beyond the BCR ABA genetic event and how to implement it into a precision medicine into your clinical practice. So I'm just passing by. I think that the, so my initial, I, I, pre, I published this paper in 2017 about the uh, mutation profile in CMF patient. So in 100 CMF patient, we sequenced their T cell uh, sample, diagnostic sample, and follow-up sample. Follow-up sample is the sample taken at around the six to 12 months after the, their TK therapy started. And roughly uh, 37 patients, I will say one third of your CMA patients, they carry certain mutation during their course of TKI therapy. And now you see here, there is a three pattern. Once you compare their, uh, uh, their mutation profile from diagnosis to uh, follow up, there is a three pattern. And this is their clinical response. So the uh, light blue means that they are responding to TKI therapy very, very well, versus uh, the orange one means that they are resistant to TKI therapy, versus the brown one, they are progressing to advanced disease. So based on this, I we divide them into a ma three major patterns. So as you can see here, pattern one, please pay attention to this. They have a really good response to TKI therapy. And you see here, some mutation was detected at the time of initial diagnosis. However, they, they are responding to TKI therapy very well. There is no change in their mutation profile. This is pattern one. Pattern two means that you see here, they are the group of the patient very resistant to TKI therapy or even progressed to advanced disease. And there is a new mutation comes up. That mutation include the uh, ABLE1 kinase domain or SETBP1 or TP53. So that kind of mutation was acquired during their course of TKI therapy and that correlated with their adverse outcome following the TKI therapy. And pattern three is that they have a certain mutation at the time of initial diagnosis, but while they are getting a TKI therapy, you see here, actually that number has gone down how, and, and you see here all the profile of the mutation include the ASXL1 or lungs one et cetera, et cetera. And now you see here, their clinical response to TKI therapy 
is very diverse. Some group, they responded very well. Some group, they are resistant. Some group, they progress due to advanced disease. So based on this, we compared their uh, molecular responses, CCYR and MMR, according to the presence of uh, some mutation in an epigenetic pathway. And now you see here, if they have a certain mutation in an epigenetic pathway at the time of initial diagnosis, their response is not that much great. And in our population, 90% of the patient get treated with the imatinib, and only 10% of the patient get treated with the second generation TKI. So I will say that this illustrates the adverse impact of uh, epigenetic pathway mutation on their outcome to imatinib. But we were curious what is going to happen when you get treat them with the second generation TKI. And then there's a data coming from the Hammersmith Smith Hospital. They compared the outcome between the imatinib treated group. You can see here, the, if they have a somatic mutation, they have a poor outcome because of that epigenetic pathway mutation. However, when they get treated with the second generation TKI, mainly with the nilotinib, now you see here, their adverse outcome has become uh, overcome by using the second generation TKI rate of MMR event-free survival, progression-free survival, and CMR-related survival all become neutralized by using the second-generation TKI. And also, uh, this is another meta-analysis data. Uh, now you see here, uh, we look at the more than 11 papers uh, published, uh, analyze the impact of uh, mutation profile in CML area, and this is a summary. Now you see here, there are several mutation or genetic events that can be com commonly detected in CML, such as a lung swan mutation and the e carotid gene deletion, as well as ASXL1. ASXL1 is detected roughly around, you see here, 10% of a patient. However, once you look at the e carcinogen deletion, at the time of initial diagnosis, it is only detected in 6% of the patient. But in case who progressed to uh, accelerate phase of plastic crisis, the number has gone up to a 16%. The same for lung swan mutation. Only 2.6% of the patient have a lung swan mutation, but at the time of accelerate phase of plastic crisis, roughly 18% of the patient they have a uh, lung swan mutation at the time of progression. So I will say that lung swan or e gene or even the PP53 has a kind of potential to identify the case who is in high risk for transformation to advanced disease. Another part is that another part that we can use this NGS technology is maybe for the detection of able one kinase domain mutation. So this is the spectrum of able one kinase domain mutation. And this, I'll just pass this one. This is the method to detect, the technology to detect able one kinase domain mutation. You see here, you can use the same sequencing, DHPLC, other specific PCR, mass spectral photometry, et cetera, et cetera. And Sanger sequencing is a kind of standard method, but the problem of Sanger sequencing is that the sensitivity level or limit of detection is only roughly around 20%. You cannot detect very minor clone based on the Sanger sequencing. So there's a lot of room to improve it. Uh, NGS, based on the NGS, you can detect up to like a 1% of case, but our current NGS, if you go ahead with the, uh, maybe 200X of sequencing death, then the, maybe the limit of detection will be around 5 to 10%. If you can reach up to 1,000 X, then you might be able to have a limit of detection of around 1% uh, uh, or 0.2%. So there's, there's some way that you can improve by using the NGS for able one kinase domain mutation. Uh, so this is the limit, limitation of current NGS technology. Based on that uh, inherited sequencing error, they can occur one out of 100 or 1,000 nucleotide. You need to improve. You need to improve your sequencing uh, detection method by using the duplex sequencing or barcoded sequencing. So I'm just passing this one. So uh, you can see that by using the NGS, you can improve your detection rate 
up to a 50% from the 25%. So this is our current uh, algorithm. I'm now currently working on this one as a, a part of research project. So using the panel, we can detect the e gene deletion, lung swan mutation, TP53, in the beginning of the diagnosis of CML. And based on the able one mutation, maybe it can guide our uh, frontline PKI treatment drug. And if they have uh, some epigenetic pathway mutation detected, then I will go ahead with the second generation over the imatinib treatment. So I, my last slide is this one. Uh, I have one more, but we have a uh, SME technology, which is uh, error, uh, barcoded error corrected sequencing. It can detect up to 10 to the minus three. And it covers most of the important genes such as uh, ABL1 and Icarus gene and the ASXA1, lung one and TP53. And we are now running it as a part of a research project at PMH in collaboration with the OICR, Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. And now I'm working on this research project. So this is my last slide, CMA Horizon. We have a lot of changes and improvement in terms of the guideline. And Asimilib is on horizon in the clinical setting of a third line therapy. And probably you will hear some other new data for frontline use of Asimini or the TFR data. Or maybe you, may, you might be able to think about the combined combination strategy of Asimini with the other TKI. And precision medicine use, it is coming and stay tuned. And remaining issue is that which gene to be included or which platform or do we need a long-term follow, et cetera, et cetera. It is not answered yet, but we are now trying to, we are now working on to generate that kind of data. Thank you for your understanding. Uh, thank you for your listening. So I'll be happy to take a question at the end of the other two speakers talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for this wonderful talk. Excellent review of CML treatment uh, 2021. And uh, we remind the audience to put their question in the Q&A. And, a, and uh, the question and answer will be at the end of this meeting. So we'll move to the second speaker, who is Dr. Abdullah Suidan. He is a consultant molecular and genetic at King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Riyadh. Dr. Suidan, he finished his hematopathology fellowship at 2018 at University of Texas. Uh, Dr. Suidan, he did his molecular genetic pathology fellowship at Pittsburgh Medical Center in 2019. Dr. Suidan has many publications, and he will talk today about uh, the CML profile by next generation sequencing. Dr. Suidan, welcome, and floor is yours now. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, having me. I would like to start by thanking the organizers and the uh, attendants. Um, uh, and it's difficult to give this brief talk, especially after Dr. Kim, he gave very nice introduction about molecular CML and um, mutational profiling. Uh, my talk will be uh, brief, um, just about what we do in molecular um, and uh, a brief introduction to uh, CML um, and some, something about mutational profiling and NGS technology. First, I would like to say that in CML and even in other, we need to have integrated approach, multidisciplinary approach. So it's not just the diagnosis clinical, not just the morphology. Now we have more. We have the immunophenotyping, we have the karyotype by cytogenetics, and have the fish analysis. We have the molecular technique, we have the BCR, NGS, and other more sensitive techniques. So we are getting more and more um, uh, data that need to be integrated for uh, optimal patient's care. And when we look about, uh, at uh, major indications for molecular testing, so we use molecular testing at time of diagnosis, and sometimes we use it for classification, for prognosis, for monitoring, detecting like MRD, and for targeted therapy. And sometimes we use molecular for cryptic analysis if it's cannot detect by um, karyotype or something. In terms of NGS, I usually use this slide as a brief introduction to next generation sequencing. It's also known as massive parallel sequencing. Basically, we read the nucleotide, as you can see here, the nucleotide sequence 
at the end of the page. This gene is Keras. And we are trying to see if there is any mutation, any change at nucleotide level. Um, compared to Sanger sequencing, uh, this is a picture of Sanger sequences in the right side. Uh, this is just a read of one sequence. On the other hand, massive parallel sequence, we sequence the same template multiple times. So you can see multiple reads, all of them covering one nucleotide, and you can get exactly how many of these reads are mutated. So you can get the allele frequency and know exactly the um, um, mutation rate or the allelic frequency. This is an example of Keras mutation, G12V, 35 G to T. Um, CML, as you know, it's one of the minor proliferative neoplasm. It's characterized by balanced translocation 922 uh, between BCR and ABL1. Uh, and it creates this uh, chimeric oncoprotein that increases proliferation, inhibits um, apoptosis. And uh, it's not specific for, for CML but it's one of the successful story for personalized medicine. Since we have the uh, imatinib and other TKI, we start to have this personalized medicine. So we can give a treatment based on this fusion, molecular fusion. And it's a successful story, as you know, in hematology and in the oncology world. In CML, how we use molecular. So we need molecular at time for diagnosis, and we need it to monitor these patients and most of these patients will eventually develop some form of resistance. So we need to detect this resistance as early as possible and interfere in the right time. At diagnosis, we usually do fish and we prefer to do um, fish at the um, um, peripheral blood, but you can also do it in bone marrow. Uh, we do qBCR, quantitative BCR. This is to give the exact quantity and as you know, Quantitative BCR is more sensitive than fish. Uh, it can detect very low quantity of BCR able. And we can use NGS. NGS is a promising technique uh, by using RNA sequencing. So you can detect the fusion also. And uh, uh, it depends on how you design your panel. So some, mutate, uh, some fusions can be missed by fish, can be cryptic. So it can be detected by quantitative BCR. And NGS is more more accurate, but still BCR is more sensitive and we will talk more about it. For monitoring, it's better to monitor these patients by quantitative BCR or digital droplet BCR. Both of these techniques are very sensitive and they can detect very low level of BCR able. And you can see uh, like the deep molecular response by monitoring this BCR. Once there is, um, <clears throat> suspicion for, for resistance, or if the patient progressed while on treatment, then using high sensitivity technique like NGS or Sanger, and NGS is more sensitive than Sanger to detect mutations. Around 95% of BCR able will be detected by fish. So fish will detect most of these cases, but there is around 2.5% that are only positive by molecular technique, only by uh, BCR or by NGS. It's just because these are some of them are very cryptic and uh, a little bit difficult to detect by fish. And again, CML is defined by BCR able one. So we need it at time of diagnosis and also we need it for monitoring. There are multiple breakpoints, as you are aware, in BCR and in able one. And this is why we have the uh, major, minor, and the micro breakpoint uh, with uh, B. 210, B190, and B230. Um, this based on the size, uh, excuse me, based on the weight, the molecular weight, so 220 kilo Dalton and 190 kilo Dalton. So basically you can have different uh, arrangements and most, uh, excuse me, most of, of cases will have the uh, around 90% or more will have the either 210 or 190. Uh, and, very rare cases will have the unusual fusions, and these are the ones that's difficult to detect by fish. Um, so again, at time of diagnosis, we need fish. Monitoring, we need BCR or quantitative BCR. Once we suspect resistance, then uh, sequencing is the best. Um, I know that most of you know for CML, monitoring 
TKI is the gold standard for therapy. Stem cell transplant is, is usually not the first line. Definitely, we need to try some TKI, but once the patient uh, develop major toxicity or progressed violent disease, then stem cell transplant is the last option. Um, this is the criteria for cytogenetic response, for hematologic response, and this is the criteria for molecular response. Again, you can see that there is difference, and we usually go by log reduction. So if there is um, slight change in the quantity, it doesn't mean the patient is relapsing or progress because there is some changes in the technique. But once there is one log reduction, like tenfold change, then you know if the patient is progressing. Several mechanisms for resistance to, to imatinib. The most common mechanism is kinase domain mutation. Uh, so if there is able one kinase domain mutation, this is the most common way. And this is the thing that we need to test for it. And there are other, uh, other um, ways to get the resistance that's less common. Several mutations have been reported to be associated with resistance based on treatment like imatinib or the other TKI. And these mutations have different locations. And it's very critical to know that some mutations are resistant to one TKI, but they are sensitive to the other. So we can switch this patient to, to the other TKI um, and some of them will show great response. On the other hand, some mutations like T315I are resistant to most of these and you need to uh, treat this patient differently. What's the indication for NGS testing or for sequencing in these patients? So we need sequencing either if there is failure or lack of optimal response to TKI. Um, we need it in cases of advanced phase, like if a patient presented uh, or a developed uh, accelerated phase, a plastic phase, or pre-transplant mutation analysis may be helpful. So if the patient has decided to go for transplant, maybe it's better to test them uh, by NGS or mutation analysis to detect the mutation and later uh, after transplant, they, 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 they will be on the appropriate TKI. Also, if the patient is in a, a treatment-free remission, then um, um, you, you, you may want to test these patients because if they develop resistance, then you, you, may, you, you may change the, the, their therapy or maybe they, they, are, they are going to relapse later if they have some early mutations. In terms of other mutation, other than able one mutation, um, there are several mutations, maybe 25 to 30 percent of CML patients will have mutation in ASXL1, T2, T3, uh, and MSH6, and others. And there are some mutations that will known to have in the chronic phase. Most of these mutations are also part of chip mutation, like ASXL1, T2, DNMT3A, TB53. On the other hand, there are some mutations that's known to be associated with more advanced phase, like chronic swan, um, uh, acarose genes, or CDKN2A, um, RB1, GATA2, uh, RAS mutations. They are also activating some of these kinase pathways, and these mutations are known to be associated with, ad with advanced phase. Um, mutation and analysis by NGS is still in the early phases, so you don't see this done routinely, but it's coming. Uh, and there are several publications that shows that mutation analysis can provide early information about the biology and behavior of this uh, neoplasm. Um, germline mutation in ASXL1 or PIM predicts uh, imatinib failure. So you may test for these genes and find these abnormalities and give you an idea how this tumor is going to behave. In terms of analyzing the NGS report, it's very critical to know exactly what's in your panel, how the panel is designed, and what's the limit of detection. Because again, the sensitivity of the panel is very, very critical. You need to have a panel that's able to detect subclonal, like around 2% mutation, 3%. So that, that's very critical to know. And also very critical to know how much they are covering of the gene. Like, are they covering the entire 
uh, able one gene or entire kinase domain or what, what's what's independent and what's limitation of the assay that, that's very critical quality of the sample is also very critical um, um, variant classification is very critical because not all mutations are the same so some mutations are pathogenic known to change the function of protein and some of the mutations are variant and non-significant or or benign mutation uh, again, sensitivity is very, very critical for detecting able one kinase domain, as this is different uh, sensitivity. So if you are talking about Sanger sequence, the, the sensitivity is 20%. So you need to have at least 40% of the samples uh, contain neoplastic cells. On the other hand, NGS, uh, depending on how you design your NGS panel, can go very, very sensitive to 1% or even less than 1%. And now with developing some ultra deep sequencing, uh, NGS has some promising data because it can be used even for MRD because you sequence the same read, the, 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 the same uh, nucleotide at least 2000 times. So you are doing multiple sequencing uh, to detect even if there is any little change in, in, in term of sequence. Also NGS can detect compound mutations. So if there is multiple mutation in the same region can be detected and also complex mutation, which is very tough to be detected by Sanger sequencing. Uh, the idea of having more sensitive technique is if you have early detection, then that will help you with early intervention. So if you wait until the resistance mutation become very prominent at 50% allelic frequency, then you miss the chance to start or change the therapy early. Um, I will end my talk by brief um, take home messages. First, cytogenetics and quantitative BCR is recommended at time of diagnosis and they, they will be very helpful uh, if you do it at time of diagnosis so you can monitor these patients. Quantitative BCR and digital droplet BCR is the gold standard for monitoring. They are the best for MRD. In, in some way, they are best than NGS because they are very sensitive. ABLE1 kinase mutation um, is responsible for resistance of TKI, either in chronic phase, accelerated, or even in plastic phase. NGS is a great technology, and uh, doing the mutation analysis for ABLE1 by NGS will provide higher sensitivity than Sanger sequencing. Uh, sequencing in general, NGS or Sanger sequencing, it depends on the quality of sample. So you, uh, the, the, the good, uh, the, the better the sample quality, the better the result, uh, uh, no, no, no matter what test you are using. NGS mutational profiling, other than able one kinase mutation, show promising finding, and it will help in early risk stratification for CML patients. However, it's not well standardized yet. So it's not, well, it, it, it's coming, but still it's not the standard uh, right now. Knowledge about the biology of the disease can allow earlier diagnosis and timely intervention. And thank you so much for uh, your listening. Thanks to Dr. Abdullah for this excellent talk. And we'll keep the question at the end. We'll move to the third speaker today. Dr. Solaf uh, Kamfar. She is a consultant adult hematology and stem cell transplant in King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Dammam. Uh, she's a program director of adult hematology and stem cell transplant. She's an assistant professor in internal medicine in Imam Abdurrahman bin Faisal University. She finished her Saudi fellowship in adult hematology and stem cell transplant in 2015. Uh, Dr. Kamfar finished her uh, fellowship in acute leukemia at Prince Margaret Center at uh, the uh, University of Toronto in 2016. Uh, she did her allogenic stem cell transplant fellowship at Prince Margaret Center in 2017. Dr. Kamfar, she had many publications. And Dr. Kamfar, uh, Today, she will talk about the treatment-free remission. Dr. Kamfar, the stage for you. Thank you, Dr. Ammar, for uh, this kind introduction. I would like also to thank the organizer for inviting me to speak today uh, in the CML webinar. Uh, my talk is basically a continuation of Dr. Uh, Kim and Dr. Suedan uh, uh, talk about chronic myeloid leukemia. 
These are my objectives. I'll discuss about the goals of CML ter therapy, the treatment-free remission definition and rationale and the data behind it, the recommendation guidelines, post-discontinuation surveillance and predictor of relapse, and finally, the management of molecular relapse and the second trial. So what are the current goals of therapy? We discussed already the therapy of chronic myeloid leukemia, and we know that the goals of therapy has changed over time since the introduction of imatinib in early 2001. Initially, our goal was mainly to prolong survival and delay disease progression, but with the further knowledge of the disease and uh, advent of uh, new uh, molecular testing and cytogenetic testing, uh, the achievement of cytogenetic remission and molecular remission became our goal. And currently, we also aim to achieve a deeper molecular response that can lead to treatment-free remission. So the guidelines had changed over time, as explained pre previously by Dr. Kim. And I just want to note also that the uh, NCCN guidelines has incorporated now the goal of uh, TFR in the um, milestone uh, goal of therapy, where you can see here in the light green, the goal changes uh, from MMR into deep molecular response if your uh, goal is treatment-free remission. So what is TFR? We do know that many patients achieve a major molecular response in the first uh, um, six to 12 months. And a large fraction of these patients will have a further reduction in the level of measurable residual disease with continual TKI therapy. This will lead to a progressively deeper molecular response. These progressive slow recruitment of patients to MR4.5 raises the possibility that with very long treatment, the level of measurable residual disease can continue to fall as long as effective therapy is continued. And these patients who are in deep molecular response will, uh, are assumed to have a more stable remission with lower probability of progression. So until recently, the recommendation was to continue the tyrosine kinase treatment permanently outside the clinical trial, but now treatment for remission is in the picture. Why would we stop the tyrosine kinase inhibitor? There is many reasons to suggest stopping uh, the treatment in patients with chronic myeloid leukemia. Most importantly are the adverse drug reactions to tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitors, either first or second generation. The interaction between these medication and other medication if the patient has multiple comorbidities. There are data also that showed that uh, prolonged therapy may impair the quality of life of patients. So stopping it might be an aim for this patient population. Family planning also is one of the most important uh, causes of stopping medication, especially in our patient population where the median age is much, much lower than in other countries where patients can present in the early 20s. And family planning is one of the first question when we start the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Patient request and long-term adherence are also causes for stopping uh, the therapy. And finally, there is marked impact on the healthcare cost if you stop tyrosine kinase inhibitor, especially if they use second generation TKI. So uh, the concept of treatment-free remission is not uh, new. Actually, it was also considered when the, uh, they used uh, interferon for treatment uh, of CML. But the first pilot study was in 2007 when uh, um, they uh, tried to discontinue imatinib with uh, strict entry criteria uh, in a 12 patient, and six of them were successful after a medium follow-up of 18 months. And this inspired the first stop uh, trial uh, with discontinuation of imatinib in patients with chronic myeloid leukemia who have maintained complete molecular uh, remission, the stop imatinib trial. They enrolled 100 patients between 2007 and 2009. And the criteria of stopping imatinib was solely undetectable molecular residual disease. Please remember that this study was in early 2007 and the, uh, the definition of unde uh, undetectable molecular uh, residual disease was there, but currently we use the term Term of deep molecular response. The relapse triggering retreatment was defined by the confirmed BCR ABL positivity or any loss of major molecular response. So around 61% of these patients relapsed and 41 maintained a TFR of around 12 months. And uh, a conclusion of the study was that imatinib can be safely discontinued in patients with chronic uh, with, with CMR for at least two year duration. The long-term follow-up of this uh, uh, this uh, study in 2017 uh, with a median molecular follow-up treatment of 77 months. The molecular recurrence-free survival was around 43% at 60 months and 38% of around 48 months. 
And this also led to the same conclusion that uh, imatinib can be safely discontinued in patients with a sustained deep molecular response with no late molecular relapses. The design of the majority of prospective longitudinal study was inspired by the uh, STOP imatinib trial in defining the minimal criteria for total duration of TKI exposure, the deep molecular response, and the molecular endpoint of defining failure. This uh, graph showed you the number of uh, studies concerning TFR that are uh, even ongoing. You can see here the median duration of TKI prior to uh, attempting stopping the TKI therapy, either first or second generation. And you can see here the TFR ranges from between the 40 to 60% in uh, all the studies. If we put them in a table view, you can see that uh, we have many um, trials concerning TFR with first line or uh, first line um, imatinib or second generation TKI. They have a variable TFR rate of uh, between 40 to 60 percent, and they actually differ also in the median duration of DMR or the median duration of tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So the question comes: Is it better to start a first generation or a second generation TKI? We do know that second generation TKI induce faster and deeper response than imatinib. And uh, this will increase the number of patients who will actually reach a deep molecular response that can, con uh, can, can put the patient uh, criteria for stopping uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. But is this enough to increase the rate of treatment-free remission? There is several studies that looked at second generation either as a first line or a second line. I have uh, this table summarizes some of the uh, uh, these study in the nilotinib and the satinib. And as you can see that the TFR rate is similar to these of using imatinib or um, imatinib uh, TFR rate. But if we can concentrate to, uh, to the evaluating a nilotinib freedom trial, we can see that they have the same TFR rate, but with a shorter median duration of stable DMR and a median duration of TKI. So it showed actually that uh, achieving um, uh, that achieved this degree of TFR only after a median of 3.5 year of TKI exposure, and this was impressive in a form of second generation TKI. And the other trial did not show any difference uh, compared to imatinib. Uh, most of these trials actually are non-randomized, except of the Hoven trial, which has only a small number of patients. But the largest so far trial is the Euroski trial, uh, enrolling uh, more than 750 patients. Uh, it is a prospective non-randomized trial, multi-center, uh, who included patients with chronic myeloid leukemia in chronic phase who received any tyrosine kinase inhibitor for three years with a confirmed deep molecular response for at least one year. Their primary endpoint was molecular relapse-free survival with a secondary endpoint that looked at the prognostic analysis of factor and the cost impact of stopping TKI therapy. So it showed that uh, the TFR rate is almost 61% at six months and around 50% at 24 months, similar to uh, the previous study. Uh, but the secondary endpoint, interestingly, showed that TKI discontinuation was associated with a substantial cost of saving around 22 million euros. And the other endpoint showed that the prognostic analysis of these patients showed that the longer treatment duration and the longer deep molecular responses duration were the main factors that can uh, affect your TFR uh, rate. There are other predictive factors of relapse. Uh, the treatment of duration and longer uh, deep molecular response are the main ones. And if we can see, this was also explained by Dr. Kim, I'll just review it very fast, that the patient, for example, if your patient was on uh, a certain TKI with an MR4 at uh, duration of four years, they will have a TFR rate of around 50%. This will markedly increase each year for example, by six year, he will increase the TFR rate to uh, 60%, which is uh, better uh, and impressive. So for a successful treatment-free remission, we need uh, both uh, patient factors and laboratory factors. You need a careful patient selection, and you need a good, reliable lab that has a rapid BCR ABL results. So these are the NCCN guidelines for uh, treatment discontinuation. They are mainly for patients more than 18 years. 
he, patient need to be in chronic phase with no history of accelerated or blast phase. They have to be on approved TKI therapy with prior evidence of a quantifiable BCR ADL transcript. They should have a stable molecular response of at least two years. Already Dr. Kim discussed that the longer duration is better, but these are the NCCN recommendation. And they recommended uh, monitoring as we will see just in a minute. The ELN, as just explained, uh, has the same uh, thing uh, or recommendation as per the NCCN. The main difference is in the duration of the TKI. So it is minimal if your duration of TKI therapy is almost five years and four years if it is second generation TKI or the duration of a DMR, uh, MR4 or better is more than two years. Optimal, of course, they will have longer duration either of DMR or TKI therapy. Now for monitoring, uh, it's very important for the timely uh, uh, PCR result for the safety for the patients who undergo a TFR attempt, because most patients failing a TFR attempt do so as an exponential increase in BCR ADL raising uh, around one log per month. So all the guidelines, the NCCN, ELN, and ISMO uh, have the same recommendation to do monthly uh, BCR ABL for the first six months of uh, the treatment free remission trial, then every two months for uh, months seven to 12, and finally quarterly thereafter. An interesting complication that has shown in patients who uh, try to stop the therapy is the TKI withdrawal syndrome. So cases of musculoskeletal pain and itching have been reported after patients uh, stopped taking tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And this was initially reported in the first 50 patients in Sweden who were included in the Euroski study. Around 30% reported musculoskeletal pain evolving gradually from one to six weeks after TKI discontinuation. And uh, some of them uh, had a localized pain in a various part of the body or uh, had some um, pain that resembles my, my uh, polymyalgia aromatica. So in the patient from the stop imatinib trial and the urus key, uh, they were systematically analyzed and it shown that only uh, almost 23% of these patients experience uh, tyrosine kinase withdrawal syndrome. The predisposing factor were mainly medical history, osteoarticular pain disease, or the duration of therapy prior to discontinuation trial. It's usually self-limiting. Uh, it can persist for months. Uh, if the patient requires, you can uh, prescribe some analgesia or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. In very severe cases, you can start some steroids in these patient population. So molecular relapse in a patient with a trial of uh, TFR equals molecular recurrence of CML. And there have been discordances in the molecular relapse definition across trials, as you can see in, in, uh, in uh, the, the retreatment criteria for this patient population. So probably this difference is mainly because of uh, various le levels of deep molecular responses, uh, inter or intra laboratory variation of the PCR assay sensitivity, and also the lack of initial consensus or the lowest amount of residual disease compatible with TFR. So in the stop imatinib trial and the TWISTER trial, the relapse was defined as the detection of a BCR ABL transcript in two consecutive samples showing a rise between the two or MMR loss at any single sample. But they have noticed that uh, in patients who uh, lost uh, in two consecutive samples, the reluctance of the patient to rapidly start therapy led to the observation of continuous or intermittent detection of BCR ABL transcript. And this did not automatically predict CML relapse. In addition to that, patients who restarted imatinib uh, did not, uh, did not, so did regain deep molecular response regardless of their level at that time. So the definition of molecular relapse became the loss of MMR in the uh, following studies, rather than the loss of deep molecular response. It's very important to note that almost all patients, even those who lost MMR, were sensitive to TI challenge as MMR or deep molecular response were rapidly regained. For example, in the Euroski, the MMR was regained after a median of three months, and the top second generation TKI, it was uh, regained after a median time of two months. So from a practical point of view, 
Resume TKI therapy at an efficient dose no later than one month after a molecular relapse. Monitor your patient transcript monthly until achievement of MMR and then every three months. Bone marrow uh, and cardiotype and screening for mutation generally not recommended only if they, the patient did not uh, uh, achieve uh, MMR uh, timely. And in case of a resistant to TKI, the end rate reduction um, of a second generation or another TKI is warranted. So uh, before uh, concluding, I'll just ask you, will you consider attempting a second discontinuation trial after regaining a deep molecular uh, remission again? So uh, in the many discontinuation studies, there was no CML-related death. And the patient who failed to remain treatment-free due to outgrowth of the leukemic growth were sensitive to a TKI rate challenge. So in the uh, re stop imatinib study, Patients who failed the first TFR and returned to the state of MR 4.5 uh, on retreatment has almost a 35% rate of a second TFR at three years and up to 72 at two years in the subgroup that re-established a deep molecular response without three months of the reinstatement of the TKI therapy. No progression towards advanced stage CML and no efficacy issues about TKI reintroduction. So the conclusion of the study was that a second TKI discontinuation attempt is safe and a first fail attempt does not preclude second successful attempt. And I think Dr. Kim also had an oral presentation at ASH uh, looking at the similar uh, second uh, TFR attempt showing similar uh, conclusion. So in summary, patients with CML who achieved a deep molecular response have a good molecular relapse-free survival and these patients should be considered for TKI discontinuation. Discontinuation of first generation or subsequent second generation TKI yields to promising TFR rates without any safety concerns. About 40 to 60% of the patient with long lasting deep molecular response on thyrosine kinase therapy are likely to remain prolonged TFR after treatment discontinuation. And the duration of DMR is the most predictive factor of the TFR. Stopping treatment can spare some patients from treatment-induced side effects and reduced health cost. And patients who failed to remain uh, treatment-free were sensitive to a REACH challenge with a TKI with no CML-related death. A second discontinuation study, uh, a second discontinuation of TKI therapy is possible and should be, but should be reserved for a selected patient. And we still need data from a larger study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salaf, for this comprehensive talk about the TFR, and thanks for all speakers for this uh, comprehensive talk about chronic myeloid leukemia. And we'll leave uh, the floor now for the audience for the question and answer. Okay, I will take the opportunity to ask the first question for Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim, what to do for patient who uh, achieve complete uh, cytogenetic response, but his, but his BCR reveal always uh, not in major molecular response. So for this, for this kind of patient, shall we continue with the same TKI or will shift to another TKI? That's a really good question. So as you can see in you know, a ELN 2020 recommendation, it mentioned that if a patient failed to achieve MMR, more than 36 to 48 months, then you can consider the switch of the medication. However, now you, you, are, you are now arguing that there are some patients who achieved the CCYR, which is equivalent to, to a two log reduction, but never achieved the MMR. In that case, it really depends on what is their goal of their CML treatment. If their goal of their CML treatment is, for example, TFR, you better to switch, you better to switch it to something else. But for example, if your patient is like eight years old now, you may just consider the survival advantage as your treatment goal of a CML therapy. And patient is now tolerable to that medication and patient has a multiple other medication. You have to consider the other potential drug drug interaction. When, when you switch it over from the, your current medication to something else, in that case, I will not try to be more aggressive. I will just probably continue your current treatment. Patient achieved the CCYR. I know it is not enough. 
However, considering the, all the kind of characteristic of the patient, comorbidity, et cetera, et cetera, I will not be that much aggressive, but it really depends on what is your goal of CMA therapy. I hope uh, that is the answer for your question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Kim. There is a question from the audience. Um, uh, patient in uh, chronic myeloid leukemia with blast crisis on major molecular response, post chemotherapy and TKI, but the patient is not feasible for transplant. Yeah, we see that kind of case uh, yeah. all the time, especially in an elderly population. Not only the CMA patient, maybe the Philadelphia positive ALA case, and patient achieved uh, some good molecular response, and you try to maintain the TKI therapy after achieving the CR, but now the issue is that, then how long do you have to continue? Probably the, there's a there's no data that you can start the TKI therapy and TFR attempt in this scenario, because as you can see, for TKI discontinuation attempt, the patient who, 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 is, who has a past history of advanced disease such as a blast crisis or accelerative phase, they are contraindicated for TKI discontinuation. So stopping the TKI therapy is not a good idea. However, then, then you need to be very careful about which TKI therapy you would like to go ahead. I think that tolerability is the key issue in that setting. So you have to choose a certain drug which could be able, which, for which a patient can maintain the medication without having any kind of tolerability issues. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kim. There is another question from the audience uh, to Dr. Kampfer. Uh, you said we have more younger patient at diagnosis in clinical practice. Is this justified to go for the second generation TKI if the goal is TFR? Yes, actually, we noticed um, in our center that the median age of uh, CML is really young. We have young pa patients, uh, both male and females, in the early 20s, uh, late teens even. Uh, actually, all TKIs are approved as first line. And in our center, in, in, in patients who are younger, and uh, the TFR is our goal of therapy, we start with second generation from the beginning. After uh, counseling with the patient, discussion about the side effects and our goal of therapy, we start second generation TKI for this patient population. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sulaf. There is another question to you. I think Dr. Dennis is <laughs> typing the answer. How to prevent TKI withdrawal syndrome? Oh, so how to prevent the TKI withdrawal syndrome? There is no way. And it's very difficult to predict it. However, some patient who had a past history of a musculoskeletal discomfort or pain before having a diagnosis of CML and treated with the TKI therapy, and they experienced the complete resolution of their that kind of musculoskeletal discomfort, they are kind of a high risk group of the patient going to develop TKI withdrawal syndrome. So it confirmed that the TKI drug is a kind of anti inflammatory it has anti-inflammatory activity. So while they are on an imaginary treatment, because it is also working as an anti-inflammatory agent, they experience the resolution of that kind of inflammation in their body. However, after starting the TKI therapy, and they re they flare their musculoskeletal symptom again after the TKI discontinuation. In that case, probably you may have to use NSAID, NSAID to, to treat the to treat the uh, that kind of musculoskeletal discomfort after the TKI discontinuation. Okay. 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 Um, there's a question also from the audience. Um, with the, with the current direction of therapy of CML, some patients who are intolerant of TKI, they may require interruption of treatment and dose reduction. How this will affect our goal to achieving DMR in treating such patients? Is it a question to me or to Solaf? Uh, I think this question to you, Dr. Ken. So can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah. Yeah. Question is, uh, 
with the current direction of therapy of CML, some patients who are intolerant of TKI, they may require interruption of treatment and yeah. dose reduction. How mm-hmm. this will affect our goal for achieving DMR in treating such patients? So that's a really good question. So now you experience a lot of uh, dose interruption during the TKI treatment for your CML therapy. And your goal is for them to achieve a deeper morophial response before you consider the TKI discontinuation as your ultimate goal of their CMA therapy. So in that setting, probably make them to have to continue to take the pill without having any kind of tolerability issue. That is your key. And because of that, they need a little bit of uh, adjust, they need a little bit of time to adjust to the your current treatment. For the reason you interrupt the medication from time to time, that is not a big issue. However, interrupting the medication uh, quite a long period of time, that will become a significant issue because it is also associated with the compliance. But based on the, if a patient maintains certain response and they achieve some molecular milestone, then I do not think that's a big issue for them to try to stop their medication just to have more time to adjust to the medication. That's not a big issue. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kim. My question to Dr. Suedan, <coughs> you mentioned that in uh, uh, the diagnosis of CML, we need to do fish. So is it for any patient you advise to do fish with conventional cytogenetic or uh, you can sub, uh, sub divide your patient. Um, so, at time of diagnosis, um, uh, f- fish is preferred with quantitative BCR. Um, the purpose of doing fish fish, fish is um, a, a good technique that can detect up to ninety five percent, and we do. Um, BCR just in case of, um, since we are going to use it for monitoring. So if you have a baseline at time of diagnosis, it's easy for you f- uh, later for monitoring. FISH is very sensitive technique. You can see exactly where is the probe and see where is the tumor cells or the, 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 the new plastic cells. So it's very sensitive. It will detect most of these cases. Um, again, if, if, if fish can detect up to 5%, BCR can detect some cases depends on, because, because there is no BCR that is designed to detect all type of fusions, even for rare fusions, it's difficult to design the probe to detect everything. So if you do both, then you will detect most of, most of the cases and for monitoring, it will be the quantitative BCR. Okay, thank you, Dr. Abdullah. There is another question from the audience. Uh, uh, I think this question to Dr. Solaf. Uh, this new tr- uh, trial from UK suggested that having a dose of TKI for one year before TKI discontinuation, increasing the TFR rates. Does the panel recommend this approach? Yeah, this is a very excellent question. So I, I looked at the data of the Destiny trial. And uh, actually, it's, it's, um, it's a good idea to decrease the dose of TKI to that. But the other recommendation and the other uh, guidelines did not recommend stopping or tapering down the dose before. Uh, uh, at- so in practice, up TKI without decreasing the dose or changing it. If you had any experience in that. So once you read the destiny trial, you just have to be a little bit careful. They reduce the dose to a half. So for example, in the patient who was taking the imatinib 400, then you re- reduce it down to a 200 and maintain it for one additional year. And then if they continue to have an undetectable transcriptor level, and then you recommend to stop them. However, any patient who lost their molecular response in first to one year, they have never achieved the TFR. So probably it, it, it gives a lot of a selection bias. So you have to be very careful to adopt that kind of approach in your clinical practice. I think that it is also consistent in the ELN and the NCCM recommendation. You just have to be very careful to adopt that kind of idea into your clinical practice. Okay. Um, another question from the audience, uh, 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 what sort of TR success rate are you seeing in your practice? I think Dr. 
for both Dr. Kim and Dr. Sulaf. So let me just uh, illustrate my situation here in Canada, especially in Ontario. In Ontario, we do not have uh, access to monthly tests. So because of this, I can't generalize the approach of the TFR. I only try to use uh, TFR uh, based practice in my patient who is suffering from the lots of drug related side effects. For some reason, but their TFR rate seems to be pretty good. It is more than what I have expected, more than, I would say more than 60%, 70%. Even they had been treated with uh, less uh, uh, treatment duration with the TKI therapy, their TFR rate seems to be at least uh, at around 60%. And I also have another group of the patient who failed the first attempt and then tried to be treated with the disartinib as a second line. And then we tried a second attempt of TKI discontinuation and they failed. However, then you know we, we we do not follow them anymore under the clinical trial however in my practice i have at least three or four patients and in some reason they ended up to develop certain pleural effusion and then now they they maintained at least the mmr without requiring any TKI, active tki therapy so there is something that it is doable to achieve a second or third tfr with a multiple attempt of TKI discontinuation. But the problem is that we cannot generalize. We cannot generalize that kind of approach to our practice. You have to be a little careful about that. So uh, in our center, actually, we started the TFR trials for the last three years. Unfortunately, COVID came and limited the access of patients to come monthly for testing. Uh, so far, we have almost 11 patients, uh, three of them actually relapsed, but the rest of them until now, um, with a median follow-up probably of uh, seven months or eight months, they're still in TFR. So I think uh, the results are actually very good and impressive. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Salah. Thank you, Dr. Kim. There is another question from the audience. If the TFR attempt is found to fail, is it likely to fail within the first three months? Can you repeat one more time? Yeah, if the TFR attempt is, is bound to fail, is it likely to fail within the first three months? So usually if they are going to lose their molecular response after the TKI discontinuation, they will lose their molecular response within first to four months within 90% of the case. So 90% of the case, they will lose their molecular response in first to three, three to four months. So probably, Maybe in first three months or four months, you have to monitor their PCR test monthly. But maybe after that, you know, their, their risk of losing their work response is pretty low, around 10%. Still, there is a case who lose their work response up to, uh, based on my experience, up to 18 months. I, did, I haven't seen any cases who lose their work response after that, you know, 18 months after the discontinuation. And yeah, thank you. Can correct me also. Uh, the the continuation trials or the follow up trials of the evaluating nilotinib trial and uh, I think Euroski trials showed that the rela the late relapses are, are rare. They are less than ten percent probably. And uh, as you said, it's it's mainly in the first few months uh, that the patient uh, will relapse. Yeah, especially in first to one year, especially in first to six months, but especially in first to four months. Okay. Oh, <clears throat> there is one question. Uh, chronic myeloid leukemia in pregnant, uh, imatinib can be used in some report. So is it safe to use imatinib in pregnant? During pregnancy? It's yes. It's different to, uh, between the male patient versus the female patient. In case of male patient, uh, probably it would be okay for them to take the imatinib. However, for female patient, because of uh, you know the neural tube defect issues, still there will be a little bit of concern. Probably in that case, you, you better to go ahead with uh, maybe other you know nilotinib or other second generation TKIs. But the SATNI does have also some other kinds of case report. So, but we try to use the concept of TFR for the pregnancy in female patient first, 
And then if it doesn't work, then we can try interferon. But the problem of interferon is that now the company who was manufacturing the interferon, they are now uh, they are now terminating the manufacturing of the interferon. Then it will make a little bit of issue. Yeah. Um, any more question from the audience? I have a quick question to Dr. Arsuaida. Okay. So uh, now you just mentioned about your NGS, but you didn't specify which sample is preferred between the RNA sample versus the DNA sample. So I wonder now in terms of the, there is a little bit of a, a debate about the, which sample is better for NGS, especially in terms of a CML, uh, a CML area mm -hmm. between the RNA versus the DNA, if you want to detect like ASXL1 mutation or lung cell mutation, et cetera, et cetera, you know, most of the, that kind of mutation detection is based on the DNA in other myeloid neoplasm. But what would be your thought about that? Do you prefer to use DNA sample for lung one or ASXL1 or TP53 mutation detection? Or do you, you don't mind to use RNA sample? And, and if you have uh, that kind of experience, I wonder whether what would be the correlation between the, uh, the result from the RNA sample versus the DNA sample? Yeah, thank you so much. Then Interesting question, and there is no, no perfect answer. I have heard several um, points of view from uh, different people, but f f for us, like, we go by the gold standard. So for, uh, for fusion testing, like if you are testing about BCR able, the fusion itself, we prefer the RNA. Mm -hmm. And usually RNA is better because you can have different breakpoints. So if you design your primers to bind at uh, the, uh, the both ends like for forward and reverse so you can cover any type of, of, of fusions even if the even if for unusual um, breakpoints then they will be aligned to the reference and you, you can detect the fusion so for fusion even dna can be used like but our rna is even better when it's come to mutation and analysis um uh, again, DNA is more stable, um, and if, if you are talking about mutation that happen within the, the, the exon, within the reading sequence, then de definitely you can detect this by doing RNA or, or by doing DNA, because both of them will have the, 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 the complete exonic sequence. If you are talking about a mutation that can happen in splice side, like uh, even with TB53 or with ASXL1, or then having DNA analysis that cover like at least 10 base pair of, of either end, uh, we, we call it the um, intervening sequences, the, 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 uh, the splicing donor and acceptor areas, then it's better to have the DNA sequence covering the splice because you will lose this splicing site mutation if you do only RNA sequence. So it's an, and there is no, 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 no perfect answer um, we, we go mainly by DNA because it's uh, stable, it's well characterized, and it can be stored for a long time. And you know, um, but, uh, again, it, it depends on type of mutation uh, that, that you are looking for. Thank you. Thank you for your insightful feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Didn't see any more question. If you allow me, I will ask the last question. When can I, if I have a patient uh, with chronic phase CML, when can I send him to allo stem cell transplant? So allo transplant for consult, or you really want the patient to have an allo transplant? So yeah. probably, if you are now thinking of uh, sending the patient for consult then if they fail the more than two line of TKI therapy, then you need to start HRA search, right? You need to try to find it out if patient have a donor. Mm -hmm. And then you can send patient for a lot transplant just to, for them to have, uh, this is also, uh, there is a potential treatment option called a transplant for your CMA therapy. And they need to know about that. There is a little bit of legal aspect about that. However, in case of chronic phase CML, 
I will let them to have a discussion in our BNT team, but I will be a little bit reluctant to go ahead into the, push the patient into that direction unless they build uh, more than two to three lines, uh, more uh, additional one or two more lines of TKI therapy. However, if they have a plastic crisis the CML and they, they just convert it to a chronic phase CML2, but in that case, I will push them to go ahead to allo transplant. Accelerate phase is a little bit difficult because some accelerate phase patient, they are super sensitive to TKI therapy and they are really, uh, they are maintaining the optimal response very nicely. In that case, probably based on the current WHO classification system, they are categorized into an accelerate phase, but their disease may not be in that advanced disease. Their disease will be still in chronic phase. However, if they already failed the first line TKI therapy, then they should go ahead to an allo transplant. That is my, that is my uh, suggestion. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Any more questions from the audience? Okay. So there is no more question. Um, I would like to uh, thank all speakers for this comprehensive talk about the chronic myeloid leukemia and comprehensive review. And also I would like to thank the Saudi Society of Blood Disorder for this organization. And also we'll thank the uh, Novartis company for uh, uh, sponsoring for this activity. And uh, I think uh, we'll finish our uh, webinar and uh, have you uh, uh, hope for you a nice day. Have a great thank evening. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.